This module will cover the basic principles of guideline development, including the Institute of Medicine standards for creating trustworthy clinical practice guidelines, the guideline development process, as well as the components of a systematic review that is used to inform clinical practice guidelines. Guidelines serve as a prism, using the light of evidence to reflect recommendations for clinical decisions, medical education, quality initiatives, and healthcare policy so that they are based on science instead of belief. At the request of the U.S. Congress, the Institute of Medicine developed standards for developing rigorous, trustworthy clinical practice guidelines. To be trustworthy, guidelines should be based on a systematic review of the existing evidence, be developed by a knowledgeable, multidisciplinary panel of experts and representatives from key affected groups, consider important patient subgroups and patient preferences as appropriate, be based on an explicit, transparent process that minimizes distortions, biases, and conflicts of interest, Provide a clear explanation of the logical relationships between alternative care options and health outcomes, and provide ratings of both the quality of evidence and the strength of recommendation. Be considered and revised as appropriate when important new evidence warrants modifications of recommendations. The IOM standards for high-quality systematic reviews and trustworthy clinical practice guidelines can help improve healthcare decision-making. Physicians and other healthcare workers are in constant need of better evidence and guidance to make informed healthcare decisions. By assembling a guideline development panel and conducting a systematic review of the best available literature, Clinical practice guidelines can be developed, which have the potential to improve healthcare decision making and healthcare quality and outcomes. The first IOM standard states that the process by which a clinical practice guideline is developed and funded should be detailed and accessible to the public. At CHEST, we ensure that the development process is clearly explained in the manuscript and any possible funding is detailed as well. Prior to the selection of the guideline development group, individuals being considered for membership should declare all interests and activities potentially resulting in conflict of interest with development group activity by written disclosure to those convening the guideline panel. Disclosure should reflect all current and planned commercial activities, including services from which a clinician derives a substantial proportion of income. Panel members should disclose all conflicts of interest and explain how it could influence the development process or specific recommendations. Members of the panel should divest themselves of financial investments and not participate in marketing activities or advisory board entities whose interests could be affected by the guideline recommendations. Finally, members of the panel should exclude a majority of members who have substantial conflicts of interest. The chair or co-chairs should not be persons with conflict of interest, and funders should have no role in guideline development. CHESS guidelines have a strict COI process, and any potential guideline panel member goes through a rigorous financial and intellectual conflict of interest review before being accepted onto the panel. <laughs>
Those that are highly conflicted are declined from the panel, and those with minimal conflicts are accepted, but with terms that manage their involvement in the development process. The third IOM standard highlights the importance of how the Guideline Development Group, or panel, should be composed. Guideline development groups should be multidisciplinary, including methodologists, clinicians, as well as populations expected to be affected by the guideline. Panels should involve the public by including patients or patient advocates. And finally, they should adopt strategies to increase patient and consumer representatives in guideline development. CHESS guidelines include a variety of individuals, from methodologists, clinicians, and other healthcare workers to ensure that the group is multidisciplinary. The fourth IOM standard highlights the importance of conducting systematic reviews that meet the IOM standards. Additionally, the systematic review team should interact with a guideline panel regarding scope, approach, and output. At CHEST, we have a rigorous systematic review process that meets the standards set by the Institute of Medicine, which informs all of our guidelines. Methodologists work together with guideline panelists to ensure that the scope and output of the review meet the objectives of our guideline. The fifth IOM standard states that recommendations should be clearly described, including a clear description of potential benefits and harms, summary of the evidence, and gaps in the evidence, quality, quantity, and consistency of the evidence, and a rating level of confidence and strength of the recommendation. CHESS guidelines meet these standards. Each recommendation in a CHESS guideline is followed by a grade, which encompasses two dimensions. First, the balance of benefits to harms, risks, or burdens, including confidence in the estimate of effect. And second, the level of evidence for the body of literature supporting the recommendations. The text of the manuscript includes a summary of the relevant literature, as well as information relating to the quality and quantity of the evidence. Additionally, if there were any differences of opinion regarding the recommendation, a description of these differences should be provided. Standard 6 states that recommendations should be articulated in a standardized form, which details what the action is and under what circumstances it should be performed. Recommendations should also be worded in such a way that compliance with the recommendation can be evaluated. The recommendations and CHESS guidelines follow a standardized general format that makes specific, unambiguous, and actionable statements that contain as much detail as the evidence permits. Standard 7 highlights the importance of the review process, stating that external reviewers should include clinical experts, organizations, federal agencies, patients, and representatives of the public. Additionally, confidentiality of the reviewers should be preserved, meticulous records of review comments should be kept, and the review draft should be publicly available. CHESS guidelines go through a stringent review process consisting of two different rounds. First, guideline manuscripts are internally reviewed by a group of guideline committee members. Any suggested changes are revised by the guideline panel and the manuscript is then submitted for external peer review with the CHESS journal. The eighth and final IOM standard discusses the updating of guidelines. Within a guideline, the publication date, date of systematic review, and anticipated date for future review should be documented. Additionally, literature should be monitored to identify any new relevant evidence. Finally, guidelines should be updated when new evidence suggests the need for modifications of recommendations. All CHESS guideline recommendations will be reviewed for currency annually after publication under a living guidelines model. CHESS is committed to maintaining guidelines as new evidence that may change recommendations becomes available.
Updated guidelines will provide the most current recommendations to healthcare providers and patients. As highlighted in the IOM standards, the systematic review process is an important component to guideline development. This is a brief synopsis of how we move from a systematic review to developing evidence-based clinical guidelines. In a systematic review, we identify and assess the quality of included studies. We critically appraise the body of evidence, and then we develop a qualitative or quantitative synthesis. This information is then used to inform clinical guidelines. Using the IOM standards, CHEST has developed a rigorous guideline development process. This flowchart highlights the key steps in our process. It begins with reviewing topic submissions. Next, a guideline chair and panelist are identified and are reviewed for conflicts of interest through a rigorous process. Approved panelists then go through an orientation to guideline development. Next, we begin the systematic review process of guideline development, which starts with developing PICO questions, searching the literature for relevant studies, and selecting studies to include. The evidence is then synthesized by extracting data, assessing the quality of individual studies, conducting any possible meta-analyses, and finally, creating evidence profiles. These profiles are then used to draft recommendations and supporting text of the guideline manuscript. A formal voting process is then conducted on the recommendations, which requires that at least 80% of the respondents vote that they either probably or definitely agree with the recommendation. If consensus is not achieved after the first round of voting, the recommendation is revised and the panelists vote again on the recommendation. This process may be continued up to three times until consensus is achieved. The manuscript is then finalized and submitted for internal and external peer review. During the internal review process, the Guideline Oversight Committee's Review Subcommittee reviews the manuscript and makes mandatory or suggested changes. Panelists then revise the manuscript and it is then sent to the CHESS journal for external peer review. Once a guideline is ready for submission, organizations are invited to endorse the guideline and once it is published, dissemination and promotional activities can then take place. These are the steps in the systematic review process of guideline development. All of these steps will be discussed in more detail in later modules for this course. The first step is to develop a protocol and select which key questions to address. Once that is determined, the next step is to establish any additional inclusion or exclusion criteria, which will then help develop our search strategy. Multiple databases are searched to identify relevant literature pertaining to the pre-established key clinical questions. After searching, studies are selected for inclusion by first reviewing titles and abstracts, and then reviewing the full text article. Any studies not meeting the criteria for inclusion are rejected. Methodologists then assess the studies for risk of bias and compile results using data extraction tools. The evidence is then critically analyzed either by quantitative analyses such as meta-analyses or qualitatively. The entire body of evidence informing the key clinical question is then graded based on study design, risk of bias, precision estimates, consistency, directness to key question, and publication bias. The entire systematic review process may be repeated as needed. For example, to look at information for possible harm, cost effectiveness, or other benefits of your intervention. The systematic review process is a core feature of guideline development.
The main goals are to collate all the relevant evidence that fits the pre-specified eligibility criteria to address a specific key clinical question, and to minimize bias by using explicit systematic methods. Systematic reviews have several key characteristics, including they have a clearly stated objective with the predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria for studies. They also have an explicit and transparent reproducible methodology. They are based on a systematic search of the literature that attempts to identify all studies that meet the predefined eligibility criteria. The systematic review also has an assessment on the validity of findings in all included studies. It also includes a qualitative or quantitative synthesis of the findings from the included studies. Another key feature of systematic reviews is that they can easily be updated if the methodology used is transparent and reproducible. While systematic reviews seek to synthesize available evidence on a topic, they also provide guidance on gaps in the evidence. A systematic review can be conducted de novo if the question is being asked for the first time, or as mentioned before, Systematic reviews can be updates of already conducted, outdated reviews. This flowchart walks you through the process of deciding whether to conduct a de novo review or an update. If the question is being asked for the first time, you will need to conduct a new review and begin by designing a new search strategy and conduct those searches with no date limits in at least two databases, such as PubMed and the Cochrane Library. If, however, the question is not being asked for the first time and a previous search strategy is available, new searches should be conducted with the publication date limits overlapping with the end of the previous search date to present day. If, however, a previous search strategy is not available, then you should follow the process for conducting a de novo review and design your own search strategy. Once the findings of a systematic review have been synthesized, either qualitatively or quantitatively in a meta-analysis, the next major step in moving from evidence to recommendation is to grade the overall quality of the body of evidence. This is done by using the grade process, using their domains of risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, and publication bias. These domains and their effect on the quality of evidence will be discussed in more detail in later modules. Once a guideline panel has graded the body of evidence, they can then move on to developing recommendations, which are informed by the findings from the systematic review and the quality of the evidence. A guideline panel can then move on to voting on the developed recommendations to achieve consensus agreement. It is important to disseminate guidelines and make them publicly available to all stakeholders once the development process is complete. CHESS guidelines are published in CHESS online and in the journal, and sometimes as mobile apps. Guidelines are also submitted to the National Guidelines Clearinghouse and Guidelines International Network Library, which are both publicly available databases that house evidence-based clinical practice guidelines. By completing this module, you should now understand the basic principles of the Institute of Medicine standards for developing trustworthy clinical practice guidelines and how to apply them to the important steps in the guideline development process. Additionally, you should have learned the basic methodology and steps of the systematic review that is used to inform clinical practice guidelines. This information will be helpful in the upcoming modules which will go into more detail about the specific steps in the systematic review process.